Welcome to another Gamma Partner Artist Feature interview. Today we speak with Nate Hill. Nate speaks on all things Web3, his learnings, his journey into the space, being collected by some of the biggest collectors, as well as some of his external work, such as shooting and creating band posters for some of the biggest bands that we know and love, and how this has impacted on him as a creator in the digital world as well. I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. All right, very excited to have Gamma Partner artist Nate Hill with us today. Nate is also a fellow Aussie. He's had a history dropping work on Ethereum. We'll dig into his whole history. But enough from me, Nate. Tell your story. You know, you can go as far back as you like, pre-Web3, pre-NFTs. You know, what got you into art? What got you creative? Tell your story. Go for it. Can do. Thank you very much for having me too, by the way. It's good to see you. Um, I am a Melbourne-based digital artist and photographer. Uh, I can go a fair way back, if you like. And uh, I will start by saying that I I think I was pretty much always a creative little kid, Um, often drawing and uh, even just imaginatively, you know, making up stuff. Uh, from very, very little, as young as I can remember, entering in um, art shows as I got a little bit older and winning like blue ribbons and all that kind of stuff as a kid. All the way through school, loved art as one of my favourite subjects uh, and uh, ended up doing a visual arts degree um, at university. Did not finish it, uh, but that's probably another story and another little creative journey that I went on. Um, ended up doing music and uh, and pursuing that for a little while, but um, and never going back to, to uni to finish. But um, at university, I did study photography and printmaking, uh, and my love for those mediums obviously never, you know, went away, even when I wasn't working in the industry. Um, so photography, especially, was a huge part um, of me, my life as I was becoming a grown-up, if you like. Uh, I was working as a drum teacher uh, to pay the bills and always had my camera with me and often make myself late for work um, by pulling over and having to take photos of things on the way to work. So uh, it was a, a passion. It was more of a hobby um, at that stage, but it was uh, it was definitely a passion. Uh, around about uh, the time that uh, my wife and I had our first kid and our only kid, um, uh, I started, decided to be the, uh, we agreed for me to be the stay at home parent for my daughter. Uh, so I stepped away from, uh, drum teaching and the music side of my life for a little while to be dad. And I started picking up the camera even more just to document my daughter's, uh, you know, life coming, uh, coming of age. Uh, and as I did that, um, I started to see sort of a little bit more interest in, you know, uh, me using uh, photography and perhaps finding some kind of little side hustle or something to do with photography as well as being uh, a stay-at-home dad. And this was all about, and this is going to age me, but this is all around about the time uh, when Instagram started becoming a thing. So I started to dive into that whole world as well. That's where I discovered um more graphic art and digital art and uh, and sort of found my way into wanting to try out that kind of stuff. So um, I would say from that point, there was a real organic um, journey towards being a full-time artist. I, I um, wanted to figure out how to do certain things. Once I figured it out, I wanted to be creative with that and find my own voice. Uh, I ended up getting little jobs here and there doing photography for bands or doing a poster or, and just very, very slowly but surely sort of found myself working near enough to full time in, um, in art whilst being a stay at home dad. And then when my daughter went off to school, I just jumped, you know, head first all the way into to being a full time artist, photographer. Uh, freelancer doing doing whatever art I could uh, forever for whoever I could, uh, and yeah, and then there was the the little side road with COVID, which pushed me in the direction of digital art, selling digital art as NFTs and and so on and so forth. So I suppose we can 
dig a little bit more into that as we go through. But that's a little bit of the backstory um, about my journey, uh, a very kind of windy but uh, organic road. Yeah, it sounded very organic. And we can see the drum kit behind you and some of your artwork up in those frames and your interest. And like you said, actually, we probably touch on, you know, doing photography for music or for bands and then creating band posters. I know, you know, from watching your Twitter and anyone who follows you, that is certainly something that must inspire you. Talk to us about that. Yeah. Well, um, I sort of alluded to the fact that um, I was... Uh, been into music as well my whole life. So it's photography, art, and music. Uh, I played in bands. Uh, uh, my younger self played in uh, many bands and, and did a little bit of touring and a bit of recording and all that kind of stuff. So I always had a huge passion for, um, for music. And then <clears throat> when photography sort of became more of a thing for me because I had that um, connection to music and knowing musicians and all of that kind of stuff, <clears throat> I'd started just rocking up to some shows and asking mates bands if I could take some photos, started to get to know, you know, venue owners and see if I could sort of find ways in to, <clears throat> to take photos of bands and then started to meet people with publications and get into bigger shows and do stuff with bigger bands. And uh, again, it was a very sort of natural organic thing because I, I felt at home in the music world. <clears throat> I knew a whole heap of musicians. Um, and I was able to use my photography, you know, to sort of get into that world even more. And then with the posters, um, that's an offshoot from the whole sort of graphic art design stuff that I started tinkering with many years ago. And again, it was a natural progression for me to want to be able to do graphical art stuff for bands because I knew bands or, you know, people started approaching me because of my Instagram and stuff like that. So. It's a, it's a world that I absolutely love. I, I like pinch myself every day that I get to make art and do photography for like my favourite musicians. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it seems to have woven together really well. And your style, I don't want to pigeonhole it, but it seems to really be derived from that part of your life. Do you find that it has guided you or kind of shaped the way in which you create when you do your own work? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, music. Uh, I always have music on when I'm creating, so that's a that's definitely a big part of it. Um, the stuff that you see, like with the tool poster, there, um, uh, a, the the ground landscapes, as I call them, uh, have a real waveform, a real kind of. Uh, <clears throat> Even though it's, there's nothing to do with music in it, it, it sort of has a feeling like there's a movement or something, you know, melodic or some music involved in it. So um, that's something that has come about just from uh, me experimenting, but then I think that I can't help but have music impact what I do when I do uh, when I make create art. Totally. And you said you were on Instagram and then you found a little passage into web three or nfts tell us about that yeah so it was around sort of mid 2020 for me that i started seeing um <clears throat> the little term nft pop up uh in amongst some artists and people that i follow uh so being the inquisitive freelance artist that i am i just kind of wanted to find out more about it so uh, I was very, very extremely fortunate to have uh, the one and only Blau, Justin Blau, um, following me on Instagram. Uh, and when I saw that he was posting about it, I just asked some questions. And the legend that he is um, really, really hooked me up and helped me get started in the NFT space. So he uh, introduced me to people that I needed to chat to about getting on platforms like Nifty Gateway and Super Rare. Um, and once that happened and I started, you know, um, figuring out what I'd want to mint and, and figuring out the way I'd want to go about it and stressing about, you know, cryptocurrency because this was all new to me, hadn't touched or, you know, hadn't been anywhere near cryptocurrency up, up till that point in my life. So once I sort of worked out all of that, um, he even bought my first NFT, my um, <clears throat> my Genesis on Super Air, which was uh, incredibly kind of him. And so once he did that, that sort of almost, um, I don't know how to put it, gave me instant credibility 
I guess, in the NFT space because he was such a figure and already known and respected in that space. So that was huge for me. Um, once that sale happened uh, and there started to be a real buzz around uh, people buying and collecting um, digital art, uh, it just kind of took off from there. Had a, a massive drop um, not long after Beeple's massive, massive sale on Nifty Gateway, uh, and it's it's been life-changing. Haven't turned back. Yeah, fascinating. And you say so you've, we've actually recently partnered with um, Super, and I was on a space with them the other day and brought you up, and they remembered oh. you, and, yeah, we're very, very happy to hear about our connection and the fact that you're a partner artist. That was a nice little, you know, meeting of two worlds. Tell us about that. You, you know, it's an interesting one as a creator to sort of dive in, if you like, into the world of cryptocurrency as well. How do you find that balance between just being able to do what you do, but then also have to have your head around what is a very, you know, ultimately a niche space still? Yeah. I, I think I'm naturally inquisitive and, and a problem solver. So for me, it was, it was, why not try this for starters? Like I could see that there were artists um, that I knew that were having a, a dabble. This is early, early days. Well, early-ish. I've got a friend, Giant Swan, uh, who is an artist, incredible, incredible uh, digital artist. Uh, and he uh, is one of the early uh people in in uh nfts and crypto so when i whenever i start talking about early days i i feel like i have to qualify it <laughs> but anyway it's 2020 um it felt early um uh so yeah i just wanted to jump in and i, I figured for me there was no harm in in trying to you know play around with new tech it's something that i wanted to do like i i want to have as part of my practice anyway is to just try things see what works see what doesn't work um so the bit that i said that was scary was just diving into crypto because yeah. you know I, I had no experience um but it wasn't actually that hard i think that the scary part f for me personally was just that you're uh, it's financial so there are there are clearly risks involved and i think i'm a little bit risk averse as a personality so it was just that little first hurdle of you know jumping in setting stuff up making sure that you're secure you know and, and making sure that you know what you're doing so like start to learn about what you're getting yourself into and so once you start doing that and start seeing how it all works for me i i've settled in and um, now i don't see it as such a risky thing although clearly there are risks involved but i think you can do it in hopefully you can do it in such a way that you know, you can look after yourself and look after your assets. Totally. And I think you made a good point about surrounding yourself with good people and asking questions and, you know, putting yourself out there. Well, I'd like to ask this and then we'll go back to your work. So for people who would like to get into the space or, or creators, artists that are on Instagram and haven't, you know, put their work on Bitcoin or on another blockchain, what sort of advice or what do you think is some key things that you've taken away from the process? It's a good question. And I do get asked it still a little bit uh, by other artists that haven't jumped in yet about what to do. So I would say huge things are, we've already covered it, uh, do some research, like, like figure out what you want to do and how you've got to do it and how you can do that safely. Um, that's a huge thing. And ask, don't be afraid to ask questions. So I had wonderful people like Blau, um, many others. So Zach, from Super Rare was a huge help for me as well when I was getting started. Um, there's a, a whole list of people that have been amazing to me along the way. Yourself is one of them too. That that um, you know that you can ask questions to figure figure things out, figure out the right way to do things. Uh, so never be. There's no stupid questions. Just mm -hmm. just you know always ask and try and work out the, the best way forward. And um, also just have a plan. I don't think. I was particularly awesome at this early on. It started to formulate once I'd made some sales and, and got going. But it's good to have a plan about how you would like to see your, uh, um, you know, uh, put 
on the blockchain for posterity and 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 figure out a, a pathway that's going to suit your practice and what you want to see your art do when you're minting it and and hopefully getting it collected. So yeah, and, and figure out good platforms as well. You know that there's amazing platforms like Gamma. This is not an ad, but you know there are amazing platforms that do look after artists. And, and so if you do your research and you you know find places that work for you, hopefully they're they're places that. You know, there's this real mutual uh, love and respect for the art, the artist, and the the way that it all gets presented. Yeah, you know, I think that that's you know really important stuff, and I think hearing it from artists is really you know pertinent as well. It was interesting. It's a beautiful segue. So thank you very much. You said about you know putting your art onto the blockchain. Um, if we look at this piece, this was your first inscription your first piece on bitcoin which is really putting it onto the blockchain it's written you know essentially for eternity or for as long as bitcoin survives which everybody would be betting would be a long time given that it's bitcoin this is on chain forever this this piece can't be removed it can't be lost uh how about how is that process and then talk, talk to us about this piece as well but let's talk first about um just that mindset shift of this is permanently on chain how did that make you feel as a creator that's amazing like, like the that thought alone it made me want to do it like the the fact that you can put something that you've created somewhere that people will be able to find theoretically forever uh, i think that's an absolutely incredible thing and i i would be really surprised if there are artists that don't want that in some way, shape, or form to have their art um, immortalized. I don't know if that's the correct word, but I think you know where I'm going. It's yeah. you know to have their art somewhere accessible that people can find it forever. I think that's an incredible thing. Uh, and again, as a digital artist myself, I think wanting to be able to use your art and technology uh, and have those worlds come together is a huge thing as well. So. Uh, yeah, it was a bit of a no-brainer for me. The the part that was the head-scratching part, which we can dig, dig into a little bit, was how to make it work because the um, minting onto Bitcoin, doing the whole ordinals thing has its limitations as well. Um, so that was something, to, a hurdle to jump, if you like, as, you, as you're planning to do these things. Definitely. No. And you still got something very sharp. We went through the process. You learned how to inscribe, how to get a Bitcoin wallet and saw all of the tooling that was available to do it. And then you got this beautiful finished piece, which has then been able to be sold as, as prints or, you know, on chain editions. Um, but tell us about this piece. You know, you can see a, a little bit, it'll, it'll clearly your style, sort of like a darkness and edge. You've got that little character. I'd like you know, th that sort of classic, like you said, waveform or depth, but then you also add that AR kind of experience using that app Artivive, you know, I guess touch on all of the above if you can. Yeah, can do. Uh, not just saying this because it's the piece that I, I pulled, you pulled up here, but this is actually one of my favourite pieces that I've created over the last little while. So it's something that I'm really proud of. Um, uh, I love the look and the feeling of it. And I also love the fact that, um, people can uh, uh, open it up in an app and it comes alive with some audio and, and some animation as well. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure how to dive in too much, but uh, my creative process takes um, a lot of twists and turns as I go. I do a lot of experimentation. I've obviously got um, skill sets from over, over 10 years of, you know, uh, doing this kind of stuff full time. Uh, there's some things that I will never give away or I'll never say never. I don't want to give away at this stage is how I create some of my bits and pieces that I feel are uniquely mine. Um, but there is, believe it or not, photography involved in this piece, which may or may not surprise you. But um, uh, my line landscapes that I make start out as photos and then get manipulated into to what you see in these pieces so uh i love that because it makes every one of them unique uh and i can manipulate the photo in such a way that you know i know what the original photo is no one else will know but 
um, it makes something unique, which which is something I love. And then it sort of combines passions of mine with the, the digital art and the photography still, that sort of real world photography. Um, yeah, the little figure, I don't know if you wanted me to touch on that as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. I'll pop up another piece and keep talking about it. Please do. So the little figure came from me creating quite early days, quite abstract feeling um, landscapes. And I felt like they were quite unusual on their own. And they then took on a real life and story of their own and scale when I added a figure. So it was something that I, I did fairly, very early in my digital art process and it's stuck with me ever since. So it's a little 3D um, figure that I have, I created. Uh, and then I use uh, various things to put uh, the 3D figure into my scenes, if you like. So another piece of mine up on Gamma, uh, one that was actually, funnily enough, um, derived the, the title of this piece, Whispers in the Echo Chamber, is actually the title of a song by an artist named Chelsea Wolfe. And so, again, I've been listening to her album and this is something that came to me. So it's, that, again, that touching of music and, and uh, art, you know, combining in my life there. So that's a little bit of behind the scenes of this one. It's another piece that has an animation, which I haven't um, got the AR uh, trigger for yet, but it's something that I plan on doing as well down the track. Uh, very cool. And tell me about what well, we've seen in this one and then and the previous one, and then we'll have a look at the next one and you wear black t-shirts, you know, that, that music, that kind of like rocky edge, have you been attracted to the, the monochrome kind of palette? Do you think it's driven from there? Has that been something that's always been with you? To, you know, I'd love to learn a little bit more. Yeah, not always. Um, and I do, I do love colour and I do actually love and enjoy working with colour, especially in my photography. Uh, and early doors with my digital art, there was a lot of colour involved too. I used to use uh, various apps and programs to quite um, strikingly, you know, colour, colourise my work. Uh, the black and white things probably come out of that whole rock and roll, you know, it's a bit of a Melbourne um, uniform as well, wearing black. So there's, there's the, the hometown, there's the rock and roll thing. Uh, I think as a live music photographer we all pretty much all of us always just wear black because you're in the pit you want to sort of blend in a little bit so you're not sort of standing out while you're running around taking photos so there's a lot of elements that that come into it and then with the art it was something that I just found I do love the simplicity of it with my live music photography I, I quite often I'll edit my live music shots black and white as well um, I like the minimalist minimalist part of it as well so just having you know those monochrome you know colors to work with uh, I think there's something really striking ab about that there's something that's uh, that's nice you can you can tell a story in a different way uh, and in a m minimalistic way that I really really enjoy uh, and there's no way to hide too with it so you've kind of you know you've got to draw draw the viewer in in some other way other than a you know a bright splash of color certainly and i know with your twisted landscapes and whatnot you know, on eth there's color there so tell me with these pieces when you're creating how do you know when you're done how do you go i like this do you have someone else you know your wife your daughter who looks at it as well or is it does it come from you how do you curate your own work as a creator it's funny that you asked about my wife and daughter my wife actually struggles with my art a little bit not all of it uh, and she does love it and she's hugely supportive. Like, she's mm. wonderful. But it's funny because I will show her some things sometimes and she goes, ooh, like almost a sense of um, like something happens with her eyes and there are certain things that I do that she doesn't like. But that's very grounding and I actually mm. really like that as well. Like I love those, those kind of honest reactions. Um, my daughter's very supportive. She calls me internet famous for my art, which I always find very, very funny. Um, but uh, no, as far as knowing when a piece is done, uh, it's probably, I, ne I never studied design, but I feel like I've got an eye 
for graphic art and graphic design. And I think my eye just tells me when something's ready. I'm also very much a person that's a doer. So I like to do a piece and get it done and get it out in the world. Like I, I, I like to move forward with these things. So I'm not huge on procrastinating about a piece. When I get it to a place where, where I like how it looks, I'm ready to share it. So I, I don't linger on those things too long. Uh, I tend to be someone that just wants to put it out in the world. Yeah, no, definitely. No, that's really interesting. And I think different artists have got different ways of doing that. And you just said about putting it out in the world. I love to ask this. How do you feel when you put it out in the world? It, it, is it nerve wracking, exciting, a mix? You know, peep, you're putting it out there for sale. There's a lot of, there's, you know, there, are, there are, I'm sure you experience a gamut of, of emotions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it can be nerve wracking. I was definitely hugely nervous the first few times I minted um, artwork. Just, you know, what, is this the right thing to do? Like, is it the right piece? Will people like it? All that kind of stuff. Because that was stepping into a new world as well when I was first minting um, digital art. But um, don't, I don't stress out too much about it. I, I tend to, I don't know whether it's a, a ridiculous amount of self belief, but I just believe I, I like what I do. Uh, and I, I think that it's good personally. So I'm happy to, to put it out into the world and share it. And I don't, I think once it's out there, I've heard many musicians talk about this. Once it's out there, it almost you have to just have, it has a life of its own. So same with a musician and a song. So are you kind of letting go of it then? And generally, as a general rule, people like seeing other people's creative expressions. So I've very rarely copped bad feedback uh, about my art. So in doing that over time, I think it just gives you confidence to continue to do it, I guess. That's probably, you know, where that confidence comes from is you, you, you do it, people like it, so you keep doing it and, you know, it flows from there, I guess. Totally. I think there's good learning for, for other artists and just people interested in the space in that as well. And these are the three pieces which you've put out you know, on Gamma as inscriptions and, and as, you know, as prints, so the, the on-chain editions. And they all obviously have an original one of one that is associated with them as well. The three are quite different, but there's obviously a cohesion with them. And for the people or the keen observers, there's 99, then 89, and then 79. So one could only predict that the next set is going to have 69 and so on. Uh, you know, you and I have discussed this, but dive into like, I guess, one maybe perhaps like a cohesion across artwork? Do you think it has to happen? You know, do you take it into consideration? And then two, just like the little, if you like, gamification mechanics or like, you know, drop mechanics for when you're putting art out there. Yeah. Uh, I am a huge believer in um, cohesion with with sets of artwork. So I, I uh, love going to see exhibitions that artists put on and you, you can clearly see that the the work has a relationship to each other. So that's something that it is important to me. Uh, having said that, uh, if you look at my Instagram, uh, I do a lot of wildly different stuff as well. So I do this black and white um, stuff that, you know, incorporates the, the kind of wild lines. Then I do photography stuff, live music photography, like the Twisted Landscapes we talked about. Uh, I've got this other sort of set of stuff that I do that is based on um, glitching clouds. Um, I do um, traditional artwork and printmaking as well. So that's something that I do that I haven't shared a lot of it. I haven't done as much of it lately, but I still do it. I still work on music and tie art into music as well. So I've got a lot of different things I do. Um, but to sort of swing back to the cohesion when i'm doing collections on different um, platforms it's important to me that they look like they belong together so i'm glad you say that those three up on gamma do look like they belong together and there is definitely a thought process uh, that i'm working my way through with these pieces and as the supply gets less you know hopefully that's kind of an interesting um, thing for collectors to look out for and then the second part of your question was gamif gamification of these kind of things or just looking at different ways of releasing things. I think that's mm. huge in the NFT space. I, I do think that it's something that is good to be mindful of 
as an artist. It's not, you don't have to do it, like obviously, like there are plenty of art, amazing artists out there that will just release their work and that's that's it, you know, and that's totally cool. But I, I do love the idea of, uh, of having incentives for collectors, uh, being able to reward people that collect you. Uh, for me, every single time someone collects my artwork, uh, that's a big deal because they've, they've laid down some amount of money to invest in you as an artist and your work, whether it's just that one-off because they really love the image or because they like what you do consistently so they are supporting you. Whichever way you look at it, it's a big deal for me. So um, all across my time on doing, uh, on minting um, digital art, I've wanted to record re reward collectors. So whether that's prints, uh, like physical prints, um, I've sent out heaps of those to collectors along the way. I've done some drops on other platforms where if you collect a certain amount of something, you'll get something in return. So definitely a big part of what I like to do in my practice as a, a digital artist selling digital art. Yeah, no, really interesting. I'm actually glad you brought up that word physical. I, you know, I have your sticker of, um, is it, oh, pardon me, I've forgotten the name. What was the piece? The, the first endless, piece? The Endless Shimmering. The Endless Shimmering, correct. I was going to say shimmers in that and I was about to mix up two of the names. The Endless Shimmering, I have that sticker on my car. You have, you know, if if you like for like a music term, merch, but you have prints and stickers and yeah, talk to us about being a creator and being multimodal in that way. Your t-shirt, your COG t-shirt, exactly, wearing it right now. I, I was going to say before, I've got to point the right way. Whoop, there it is. You know, the black <laughs> and white monochrome, that's the gamma colouring. We have, you know, extremely, you know, <laughs> aligned uh, aesthetic sense but um yeah the the physical and the digital and that being multimodal as an artist yeah the, again huge for me and in studying visual arts it's where i started is the physical uh art so printmaking in the dark room as a photographer actually you know printing out your work so it's a huge thing for me uh i love the tactile nature of being able to hold on to something you know, and appreciate it not on a screen as well as obviously being a digital artist, I appreciate the screen as well. But, mm. um, but yeah, to have a piece of artwork and to have it up on your wall or um, to be able to flick through a book and look at, you know, the art that's been created, it's a huge thing for me. So I will always do prints. Um, I've got a, something that I haven't talked about publicly. I've got a series of things that I'm doing um, this year, I'm doing a monthly project uh, that by the end of the year is going to be a physical exhibition and a album launch of music. So it's it's stuff that's always going to be integrated into what I do is having those that physical artwork for sure. Love that. That's a little bit of alpha for the listener. And yeah, same here. The physical and the digital, like they can coexist beneficially to each other, really. And yeah, so, you know, what can we expect next? What's going to be the, you know, the next set that's going to be 69, you know, on-chain editions or prints as we call them on Gamma? Have you started thinking about that yet? I have, absolutely, yeah. I, I feel like I've got the next couple mapped out that are going to go up on Gamma. Um, it's definitely, again, going to be a black and white piece that uh, involves my kind of wild lines. Uh, I... Within the next few pieces, there's going to one of them is going to be probably one of my most liked and shared images off social media that'll that'll be as long as I can get it to look the way I want it to look within the restraints of um, of minting on Bitcoin. But uh, yeah, no, definitely plans uh, and hopefully stuff that people will enjoy and want to collect. Amazing. And I didn't probe on it as much as I was going to earlier, but now's a good time to bring it up. In the Endless Shimmering, if you use the app Artivive and you hold it over the piece, the, the door, if you like to call it, uh, animates and also music comes on. So you have woven that in. Uh, yeah, tell us about that music. Have you created it? How does that all occur? And yeah, how, if, if someone owns that piece and, and didn't realise they could do that, can you explain that in a little bit more detail? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I, at this stage, I use uh, an app or a platform called Artivive, as you mentioned. Uh, 
it's an amazing uh, platform where you can, uh, the, the app that's on your phone, you can look at a piece of art and, and it triggers, you know, an animation, it triggers the AR experience. Uh, and it looks amazing, like on your sticker, when you can, you can kind of look at it from different angles and get in close and the, the, uh, the technology behind it is, is amazing and I love that little, you know, little bit of magic, I guess, uh, that uh, people sort of, you know, find when they, they first figure out what you're doing with that, uh, with that app. But um, the music on that particular piece was made by a good friend of mine whose name is Peter Bowman. Uh, he has a studio. He and I work together a lot on music. He's uh, the other half of uh, a massive, this massive project that I'm undertaking this year. Uh, too. So big shout out to my friend Peter. But uh, yeah, so he made that piece of music. It was actually originally designed for something else. And then that didn't happen, which, uh, you know, it's an artist's life. You know, you, you have projects that sometimes, unfortunately, don't, um, don't, you know, go all the way through and get finished. Uh, so I had we had this little piece of music there that was not being used for anything else. So it got woven in to this piece, and I'm really stoked with how it all kind of came together. Uh, and animation-wise, uh, I use anything I can get my hands on to to be able to make something interesting. So for that particular piece, I used an app that is uh, called Glitch Lab, uh, and it's an Android app uh, and it does amazing things with lines and pumps out some very high resolution results too so there's a little bit of behind the scenes of how these things get made yeah people always love hearing you know at least those little tidbits or something that they can go and explore with you said earlier you do you play with a lot of products you know you you've used a lot of apps you've used a lot of your experience in music and photography and digital art and getting to know people I guess that's a great lesson for your people in the space. Do you want to touch a little bit further on just that kind of, I guess, adventurous part of your uh, uh, process, I guess? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I've, a little bit of advice that I would give anyone um, trying to break into doing something creative for a living is that yeah, it's, there's no harm in asking uh, people about things and opportunities and, you know, uh, what you could do. So, uh, start, <clears throat> excuse me, started uh, with me asking other graphic artists or digital artists on Instagram how they were creating things that they were creating or just, you know, can you point me in the direction of a program or an app to use? So it started there. <clears throat> and for me, uh, it's sort of always been a case of um, just trying things and working out what works, <clears throat> asking people if they, they need anything from you or if there's an opportunity to collaborate, and that opens other doors as well. So, <clears throat> and that's something that I should touch on more is collaboration, because that's been a massive, massive part of my journey as an artist is working with other artists, whether it's musicians or, you know, um, digital and, you know, physical artists. Uh, it's been a huge thing for me. And that's how you learn as well, is, is you're, you're working with people that have a different point of view, have a different school, skill set, different tools they use, and you can take bits and pieces of all of those things and apply it to what you do as well so <clears throat> just dive in and, and do is is the huge bit of advice from me is always just keep doing things and trying things and asking people about it i love that dive in and do is a lot nicer than saying just be proactive it's that's a great <laughs> phrase and on photography so wait well you know sort of away from the space but you know Bit of a random question. Who's been the best band that you've shot or the most fun gig that you've been had the pleasure of, you know, getting paid to be there rather than just paying for tickets to, you know, rock out? <laughs> yeah. I do love not having to pay for tickets. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's really hard to pick one. Uh, above my head here is um, Royal Blood. Uh, that's one of my favourite ever shoots that, <clears throat> and one of my favourite ever live music shots that I've ever taken is that one up there. That's, um, that was pretty amazing. But I've been so, so very fortunate to, to be at shows of my heroes and bands that I've loved forever. I've got to meet um, people like Paul Dempsey, 
Uh, uh, can't get these the right way. <clears throat> Who is the lead singer of my favourite band, Something for Kate. I got to meet him and I've, I've shot that band a bunch of times. Recently got to shoot Blink-182, which was really, really cool. Uh, being a drummer myself, getting to take photos of Travis Barker, um, who's just one of the all-time drummers for me, was uh, pretty amazing. But heaps, so many bands, I can't even... I can't even start. Like Queens of the Stone Age, I've got to shoot them before. So, yeah, you, you name a band, I've probably shot them at this point. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Nate, it's been a pleasure diving in, uh, you know, an absolute pleasure, you know, becoming your friend but also helping onboard you to Bitcoin and having you as a partner artist. And we can't wait to see what else you drop with us and, you know, love from Gamma to you and thanks for spending the time today. Uh, thank you so much. And again, not just saying it because we're, we're chatting. It, it's been great getting to know you and I'm so thankful for your help um, when I was getting started with all of this stuff and continued help um, on Gamma. It's been amazing. I'm a huge fan of the, the platform uh, and what you guys do. And if anyone's watching this, considering, you know, minting on Bitcoin, a huge, huge um, encouragement for from me would be to, to look into doing it with you guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Nate.